फॉर्म से एक छोटा कर Good afternoon, everybody. Today I will be sharing with you how I understood Boningerson's approach while reading his lesser writings through his account of his own illness and its treatment. Boningerson is not very well understood master, even though all of us are made to study it in our repertory subject. I have found that uh, one way of understanding masters is by understanding their life and their lesser writings. Because they give you certain insight about the personalities and the contributions that they made in the homeopathic field. So I would be basing my presentation on Boningerson's biography and his lesser writing. Boningerson was a lawyer, a civil servant, he was commissioner of registration of land, that is a revenue officer, he was a director of botanical gardens and for some time he also worked as a royal librarian. He came from aristocratic family and he enjoyed good reputation with the government and the society. If you will uh, look at the, all the jobs that he did before converting into homeopath, we realize that all these are disciplines which uh, need strong analysis or a system of classification, whether it is law, whether it is botany, whether it is library, they all operate on a system of classification. And that is what made Boningerson the ideal person to be the father of repertories in homeopathy. As mentioned, his objectives as a repertory maker were to have brevity, completeness and easy consultation. You should be able to refer the rubric very fast. What is not so much recognized is his contribution to homeopathic philosophy also and what role he played during his time for homeopathy. That was the period when homeopathy was under attack from various quarters. 
and boni gasen as a lawyer and a person of repute he stood strongly with homeopathy and he defended homeopathy as a authentic scientific system he put his integrity at stake by publishing cases treated by him which were recorded in a bound register month after month so that there cannot be a uh, allegation of selective reporting the conceptual contributions in homeopathic philosophy that he has made with a big jump a strong leap which many of us still find difficult to comprehend or implement to take an example is concept of grand generalization his concept of concordance we already studied his contribution as a repertory master of repertory what i have found very uh, important is uh, since we practice at palgar that he was a pioneer in homeopathic rural and veterinary practice because he stayed in the rural area and his patients were farmers and their animals so his approach becomes eminently suitable when you are working in rural areas all of us know about uh, quiz quid etc because that is part of our repertory syllabus and we have to answer that the origin of this is his treatise concerning the greater or lesser characteristic value of symptoms occurring in disease which helps in therapeutical selection of the remedy this is published in lesser writing the story behind this particular article is very interesting there was a international homeopathic congress in brussels where he proposed that there be a prize for a question on which homeopaths across the world should write essays and that was regarding this the relative value of symptoms and that and he announced personal prize for the best essay but for 3 years nobody took this challenge it was a shiva dhanushya so finally when bonigasan realized that nobody is in a position to give how to value symptoms he kept aside his prize prize and he himself wrote the essay it is based on a hexameter from theological scholastics for judging seriousness and grievousness of a moral disease so it is interesting to know that home our master homeopaths they usually were student of some philosophy and they borrowed that knowledge and applied it in homeopathy naturally all master homeopaths start from what master animan has said and boni gasen is no exception he is the i would say a bhakta hanuman for boni for animan so he starts with the hanimans guideline about pqrs symptoms and then he applies that hexameter which all of us have memorized so i am not going to teach that because that most of us will know the personality the nature and peculiarity of illness location or seat of disease accompaniments or concomitants causes modalities and the time dimensions so these are things which we, we all of us know the issue is how bonigasan applied this particular concept of totality into his own life and that is why i would be dealing with we know these things about bonigasan's concept of totality the principle of generalization on grand scale which many of us find difficult because we are stuck to particulars prime importance of modalities doctrine of concomitants which are given high value in boningerson scheme of the things importance of generals because he did away with particulars the doctrine of analogy that is what is true for a part is true for the whole and concept of totality as a grand symptom comprising of three elements that is location sensation modality and to which was added the fourth dimension that is concomitant 
it has been bonigasan has been criticized for less attention towards mental but as you will see that mental state has been used for final stage of differentiation so this is a theoretical background some of most of us would be aware of we also are aware of the in the history of homeopathy how bonigasan became homeopath this story most of us know that he was very sick on the it was prognosticated that he might die because he had a purulent tuberculosis and two of the physicians had said that this will not improve and his health was deteriorating this is a point at which dr way was consulted and he prescribed pulsatilla with great relief to hanim or to boningas this all of us have read in our undergraduate days this was something when i studied boningasan i was not uh, comfortable with this story these were the questions in my mind how how can we be sure that as a student when i was in lcs my questions were these how am i sure that he what he was diagnosed as purulent tuberculosis was actually tuberculosis or it was some other lung infection but more important than that was my question what is the similarity of bonigasan with pulsatilla because if you are treating chronic deep seated pathologies then uh, you require chronic forces constitutional remedies and uh, how would bonigasan's personality match with pulsatilla so this was always something in my mind and i was not resolved whether it was tuberculosis or not is not uh, so important he was uh, definitely suffering from a severe lung infection that is clear so that was not so much of a problem for me but this pulsatilla business was bothering so when i was uh, reading the lesser writings on page 203 of lesser writings from 2203 to 206 he has narrated his own severe illness which was treated by himself with homeopathy and when i read that account it's a three page account some of things started fitting in my mind and i felt that i understood boningasan and his uh, approach better so i would share that account with you what he says is uh, around february of that year he came down with certain complaints and see how he describes the causation caused by excessive mental exertion with sedentary occupation and night watches caused by multiple official duties in the course of a winter so he is talking of lifestyle worries multiple intellectual activities and the weather so is identifying so many causative factors and he has described how the illness progressed step by step initially there was loss of appetite weight loss and constant indolent stool so considering this to be a indoor position he tried modifying the mode of living and diet but it did not respond the complaints kept on increasing and he developed convulsive constricting violent pain in the right side of abdomen with severe distension of abdomen and total constipation he naturally if we will study all the causative modalities and uh, these constrictive pains with constipation naxomica comes as a first remedy so he took naxomica 30 but no effect in and no stool passed for 11 days with dreadful pains so obviously the diagnosis went towards ilias physicians two physicians examined him and they declared that this could be ilias then two of his homeopathic friends the one whom he had who had treated him earlier they visited knowing his sickness now around this time there was a lot of debate going on among homeopaths about whether we should use higher potencies 
and most of the homeopaths in germany were against using potencies beyond 6 and 12 so they told him that maybe uh, you have taken wrong potency and these are the lower potency actual potency that will work in this pathology so they advised you take naxomica 12 against his wish he took but it did not relieve in fact it produced proving and additional symptoms of nux so next day again they visited he was at by this time anxious so he was subjecting himself to treatment by others so they suggested a coculus because of the elements from loss of sleep and all that no relief so by this time his conscience was had started troubling him that he was taking medicines in potencies that was against his conscience and they were not relieving so this is how he expresses his state and how he decided to go further i took the image of my symptoms in hand determined not to quit until i had either found the suitable remedy or was delivered by death from my torments so he decided i will live or die by homeopathy and i will take potencies that i believe in even if it means my death and i will not prescribe till i am clear of the totality on the 12th day of his illness with agonizing pain and with fear uh, possibility that this can end fatally he decided i will not prescribe to myself till i am clear of the totality no wonder a master can take this stand and he could observe his illness for 24 hours more with his agonizing pains i think we would have pre- changed four or five prescriptions in that period for 24 hours he observed now all that he has observed and that he has reproduced in the story told so far so it was in a descriptive form so my own comprehension of our lsmc model i have tried to organize it on the scene on the 30th 13th day in the lsmc form that i have already narrated causation the sensations the location and the concomitant where he now this is something i found peculiar that in both his illnesses he has this thought in mind ki i can die so whether this is a accompanying fear of death that he had that time also and now also which is his, maybe his individual peculiar mental state with illnesses and the diagnosis could be subacute intestinal obstruction or he was saying there could be twisting of the intestines we can't go into diagnosis beyond what is already described so he observed this i have tried to repertorize now these symptoms according to what we know of the boninghasen approach getting the causations the location the sensations and the concomitants naxomica is the first remedy which comes but which had failed in multiple potencies the other remedies which come up are arsenic lycopodium nitric acid if you see some less covered remedies in the same uh, order then you see thuja konayam thuja is not covering the causation but covering all the sensations and the commental concomitant naxomica lyco they are covering all the causation lyco is also covering quite a lot of remedies uh, rubrics so after this study and observation for 24 hours this is the action and the result Boninghasen took one dose of thuja 30 at midnight and pain started reducing in 5 minutes had copious stool in 10 minutes and fell into refreshing sleep the effect is magical when the correct remedy was pursued and he was relieved now again what is the role of thuja can be a interesting question but what unfolds further is more interesting and it tells us more about boninghasen and hanuman and their relationship and their thought processes he wrote this entire account of the illness and 
how Thuja relieved him in a letter to Hanuman. He was in Hanuman was in Kothen, and he was sick. So, and the time taken for the letter to physically reach Hanuman and for him to respond after recovering from his own illness. And for him to get back the letter, by the time he received the letter, it was May. And he describes this interaction. Hanuman read all this, was happy with the role of Thuja, and suggested examine the role of Lycopodium and Konayam as follow-up remedies. And Bonigasan says, before I received this letter in May, after Thuja, I had immediately followed it up with Lycopodium 31 dose and after one week, Konayam 31 dose. Both were senior citizens. And he was alright for one year. And after one year, there were mild recurrence of these abdominal complaints and he repeated one dose of Lycopodium with total relief and that complaint never recurred. So when I read this account and how in the repertorization the coverage of Thuja, which is covering the location, the sensation, the mental concomitant and the psychotic pathology of constipation with paralytic areas and how he used that and the correspondence of Lycopodium, which was the next remedy. I felt that at least from our ET point of view, Boningasan's understanding was complete. Maybe Pulsatilla was an acute phasic remedy in the case, uh, in the state of res respiratory infection. Thuja was the psychotic intercurrent and which covered the qualified mental state and psychotic miasm in him. And Lycopodium could be his deep acting chronic constitutional remedy. So when both the illnesses were studied together and the symptomatology was studied using Boningasan's approach, I felt that the totality of Boningasan was complete. And the thing which has stayed with me is the qualities of a master, which we can learn from these experiences and writings. The stability of the mind. In crisis, even when we or our close ones are sick, adherence to homeopathic principles under any circumstances, whether it is weight when in doubt, whether belief in the higher potencies and the concept of remedy relationships, he stood by all the philosophical concepts that he and Hanuman had exposed, even when there was a fear of death. So that is a true mark of a master, according to me. They do what they talk. And if we are, and they don't compromise. So if we understand these aspects of our masters, then we will have the courage to follow the methods that they have laid down. I hope that this particular small top motivates you to take further study of Boningasan and read his lesser writing in the original. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending this live session. We would like to take up some questions. Please mention them in the comment section. Quite interesting, like Obodium Pulsatilla Thuja. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
in see the elements of senior citizens old age and that is a particular concept of intercurrent that bonigasen used to use he never repeated a remedy he would always intervene another remedy before repetition now that you can study it is not a very well understood concept not commonly practiced by us but he would never repeat a remedy he would interpose another remedy before repeating it it seems very stringent the use of sixth potency only 12th potency only we don't use it nowadays the so. entire german homeopathy got divided over this and finally hanuman disowned many of his disciples because they were not willing to go beyond 6 and 12 so this boningasens one of the major contribution is espousal of higher potency in his time it was 30 and 200 maximum during his lifetime but he pers- he produced his monthly report ki these many cases i have treated in these cases and he faithfully record, reproduced every case treated whether success or failure to demonstrate efficacy of and he throw it through a challenge you can come and check my records because it was bound volume so nothing can be inserted or removed so he put his own integrity that i am sharing not just my success but my success and failures and you can cross examine and since he was treating animals sometimes whom he had not seen also the farmers would come and take medicine and report back so he was saying ki if homeopathy is placebo or faith healing how are these animals and these farmers getting better with the medicines i am de- giving and you can cross check so he was firstly this charge of placebo also and the efficacy of uh, 30 and 200 potencies for both the method followed by him was putting his integrity for examination and his own success and failures not many of us will do we present our successful cases but we don't present cases i have treated in this month <laughs> so that is remarkable about the i mean when a person of his stature he puts his integrity at stake for homeopathy and say this is what i have done i have experienced my success failure are before you take it or leave it now as a lawyer that was the best strategy he employed to defend homeopathy So someone who is a lawyer can become a good lawyer. Yes, not just someone who is an advocate. So one more question. Now should we revert to sixth and twelfth now? Because now no, he them. stopped sixth and twelfth. You can use any appropriate potency, but there were opposition to use of higher potency at all. So we believe that the, all the potencies have the place under the sun. So there is no problem with use of lower potency, but there should not be opposition to use of higher potency. That was his point. We, and he experienced better results with higher potency. Meaning in those times, thirty and thirty and two hundred. Then afterwards came came and then it went up to fifty m and c m. But in his time, because they were all physically prepared potencies, during Kent's time the machine came up, so the higher potencies became possible. Any other question? Don't have much on the this thing chat box. So in a way, our half an hour is over. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Thank for you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.